As a small business owner, your to-do list is long. The Knot makes advertising easy and connects you with the right couples at the right time. Visit vendors.thenot.com slash podcast for 15% off your first month with code podcast15. Hello, and thank you for listening to The History of World War II Podcast, Episode 160, Leningrad Under Siege, Part 2, Unarmed for War. Last time, as war came to the Soviet Union, the men and women of Leningrad rose to the occasion, volunteering to help the state and their city to fight off the Germans. The men either went into the military or were organized into partisan units. The women were sent south and to the southwest, to dig anti-tank trenches. But though digging ditches was a rather straightforward affair, the process the men went through to be prepared for war was anything but straightforward, or thought out, or well-organized, or effective. Early into Barbarossa, General Zhudanov, in charge of the Northwestern Front, asked the Stavka if he could form Apochinev, volunteer divisions, thinking these men could perform basic guard duty and one day be absorbed into the army reserves when their numbers fell from combat. Zhukov in Moscow not only said yes, but he wanted seven divisions of such formed straight away. Soon after, Moscow sent out word to all the large cities to begin forming their own Apolchinev. Clearly, this was a good idea, until it wasn't. When Leningrad had its first 31,000 volunteers, they were put into the first three divisions. The first division was called Korotsky, after the Korov Defense Works, as each division was named after a Leningrad district. As these men had all worked together, they knew each other, and so morale was high from the outset, as they all bragged about what they were going to do to the Germans. But already, this siphoning off of worker talent affected the city's defenses. Moscow had ordered Leningrad to retool in order to make weapons, but now a significant percentage of the very men needed, engineers, scientists, and highly skilled labor, were in uniform. As for the factory managers, now with official quotas in their hands, they quickly cried foul and asked for permission to hold back their best workers. Yet, in those early euphoric days, most of the workers marched off to war anyway. Of course, many of the workers had assumed that they would be used for home guard or local defense, if the Germans ever got this far. And that may have been Moscow's plan, were it not for the absolute blistering pace the Wehrmacht approached the city in the areas to the south and east of it. But now that the volunteer divisions were formed, the party did not trust them, as it had been a grassroots movement. Was it such a good idea to give these tens of thousands of men guns? And it got worse. Many of these men were of the intelligentsia class. They had ideas, wanted things discussed first and voted on before being carried out. They also wanted the right to approve of their political officer. That right there would have gotten them all shot if Stalin had been on hand. So it will come as no surprise that the Stavka had this kind of thinking brutally stamped out. Yet some of the men's requests were logical. Radio engineers were requesting to be signal officers. Miners wanted to become sappers. But that wasn't the point to the Stavka. They would decide who went where and when. And yet, for all of the harsh measures, these highly cultured types never fully molded into common soldiers, as in obeying orders without thinking. Of course, most of them did not live long enough to have to worry about such things. As covered last time, elements of the 1st Kirov Division received upwards of 16 hours of training before marching out of the city, to the cheers of their former comrades and friends. Yet once outside the city, they would be ordered to countermarch no less than three times, so they could gather their uniforms and guns. However, as some of those guns were over 40 years old, they should have been shipped out with the other museum pieces. 
but their equipment deficiencies went far beyond that. They were not given anti-aircraft guns, not that they knew how to work them, nor did their mortars have sights, a recipe for mass suicide if ever there was one. The men kept marching until they reached their part of the defensive line, between Luga and Novgorod. And at that very moment, the area was under an air raid. The men of the 1st Division could only dive to the ground, having no anti-aircraft weapons. Other units from Leningrad went through the same thing. The men had to learn how to use their guns during battle, as shells came at them. That was the 2nd Division. The 3rd went into battle with no armored shells, no grenades, and no mortars. They also had no gun oil. Clearly, their weapons had not been cleaned in some time. To the public, the party praised these brave volunteers who dashed off to fight the Germans. Reports rang out that in this unit, there was a student standing next to his professor. Here, there was an architect standing and fighting next to a baker. They were putting the country, the state, before themselves. Yet privately, and these records were not released until after the war, the various officials between Moscow and Leningrad admitted to each other that these men would merely serve as cannon fodder. But hopefully their numbers would at least slow down the German tide until the regular soldiers or real reserves could be brought up to snuff and up to the front line. So it is not surprising that by late September, the Germans told the world of their numerous victories, of their almost countless prisoners of war. How could they not think that victory would be theirs before Christmas? The 2nd Volunteer Division saw action first, on July 13th, when it was ordered to halt the advance of some panzer units as they crossed the Luga southeast of Kingisap. The tanks were not stopped. Many of the Russians died, fled, or were captured. The same thing happened to the 1st Division and 3rd Divisions seven days later. The Stavka sent people to investigate. The resulting report said that those defeats were because the men threw down their weapons and ran. Never mind that those weapons were no good against a tank and may not have been operational in the first place. Slogans were thereafter created to help the men remember the basics. Losing your gun is a crime against the motherland, and a soldier's power is his weapon. But slogans weren't the only mind games played by the generals, safely far away. Rumors were put out that many German tanks were fake, balloons in fact. One such rumor went, the tanks stopped. An officer got out and leaned against one with his elbow. Well, as you know, elbows don't make dents. The tanks turned out to be fake. But they weren't fake. They were made of fine Krupp steel. It was the rumor that was fake. In order to get these untrained, untried men to rush at the metal beasts with relics from a war long past. On the other side, German Chief of Staff General Halder could not believe what they were up against. This was the great Soviet army. His diary had the following condescending entry, typical of a Russian attack. Three minutes artillery barrage, then pause, then infantry attacking as much as 12 ranks deep, without heavy weapon support. The men start hurrahing from far off, incredibly high Russian losses. Of course, these various steps would be altered and improved in time. But for the foreseeable future, as we have already seen, the Russians continue to lose many, many men for different reasons. One Russian infantryman would later write of this time, You're so terrified that your legs root themselves to the ground. It's extraordinarily difficult to make yourself get up, pick up your rifle, and run. Their immediate superiors had it no better. Many of them who lived through the early battles were immediately suspected of arranging an early retreat. Just before being demoted, along with the 85 surviving men still with his battalion, 
to serve as partisans. His superior yelled, I know exactly why some of them ran away. It is because you lost your head. You didn't understand that you have to lead. Thanks to your failure of leadership, they ran away in animal terror. Which was poppycock. The senior official was only merely protecting himself. And, of course, what was not addressed was how flesh was supposed to oppose steel and explosives. Not to belabor the point, but the early volunteer divisions, and there were many of them from the large cities, but especially those of Leningrad, did not even have proper communications, so ended up firing on fellow divisions nearby. Many of them did not have surgical equipment, but most didn't have surgeons or nurses either. Instead, they just had Red Cross girls, who were certainly brave, but again, not properly trained. The soldiers did not have enough first aid kits, and besides, weren't taught how to use them. More than a few men, suffering simple wounds, bled to death, all for not knowing how to stop the flow of blood. There was always a shortage of medical transports. If an injury meant you couldn't walk and no one was willing to help you, you were as good as dead or captured. Within the first three volunteer divisions of Leningrad, one of the results of all this chaos was suicide, especially among the officers, and it reached shocking levels. Many who left notes before shooting themselves stated that, to be responsible for so many lives of people they had known for years, but not having the means to teach them how to fight and survive, was beyond what they could endure. It was better to kill themselves than to get so many of their friends and colleagues killed. As fast as the Stavka knew these divisions would be decimated, they found the Germans' progress even faster than planned for. So ordered Leningrad to create four more Obolchinye divisions. Yet the man pool to draw from was shrinking fast. The Stavka reacted by allowing many they had turned away the first time. White tickets, slang for those who fought with the white Russians during the Civil War and Revolution, spectacle wearers, and sons of the enemies of the people. Also, age limits were altered from 18 to 17, and from 50 to 55. And though these four new divisions were to be labeled Guards Divisions, a supposed honor in military history, these men went into battle even more pathetically equipped. Here's a question for you. What would you do to save humanity? And how far would you go to stop someone who was getting in your way? The ancient rivalry of assassins and Templars cuts to the heart of good versus evil. But it wasn't always clear who was good and who was evil. Plug in to explore the amazing world of medieval feuds. Echoes of History. Assassins vs. Templars is a special collaboration between History Hit and Ubisoft, the masterminds behind the Assassin's Creed games. Hosted by Dan Snow from History Hit and Matt Lewis from Gone Medieval, together they will take a close look at the real history of the secret societies, which inspired the Assassin's Brotherhood and the Templar Order in the Assassin's Creed games. Plus, they will bring on other premier historians as they discuss unearthing the myths of the Grail and who really was the inspiration for the main characters in the game. Echoes of History, Assassins vs. Templars podcast is available right now wherever you get your podcasts. Listen and subscribe to Echoes of History today to discover the hidden truths that have shaped our world and inspired the video game series. That's Echoes of History wherever you get your podcasts. Listen today and subscribe for more. The outcome of these newer divisions' first battle on August 11th went as those before them. And though there were thousands of deaths and many more wounded, the division only had four medical trucks. As for the men of the 2nd Guards Division, a report after they were slaughtered, had to admit that the men did not know how to handle their rifles or grenades. They were not dug in properly. 
they had no practice at this, and many unit commanders did not know their own men. And most shockingly that, those in charge of the men, just before the battle started, loaded their weapons for them, because the men did not know how. By September 19th, it was obvious that not only were the volunteer divisions not getting things done, but were a waste of what resources were to hand, as armament factories were moved to the Urals. Those that were still alive of the 135,000 volunteers of Leningrad were merged into the regular army and retrained. But of that number, there were now some 50% of them now gone whether dead, missing, or captured. Had the volunteers made a difference? Probably not. But the answer is a most definite no when you consider the number of skilled workers removed from the factories. Another significant mark in the negative column would be the number of officers killed from late June to late September who were trying to lead these desperate men. By then, some 142,000 out of the 444,000 had perished, along with the rank and file. But a month before the volunteers were either taken into the regular army or made partisans, as Leningrad was three-fourths of the way surrounded, the question came which had to be answered. Was the city to be abandoned? The only rail line going out of the city now still in Russian hands, led due east to Imga. But there, the Germans were already fighting for control. To make things worse, it was now obvious that the Finns, already along the northeastern corner of Ladoga, were fighting their way to the south. Was their goal to link up with the Germans, who would, by then, be expected to have the area east of Leningrad in their hands? All those Soviet troops within and around the city could not be lost. Something had to be decided and acted upon. But Stalin trusted few people, yet he found enough to send as a fact-finding group to the area to see what should be done. So during the third week of August, a special train approached the area to the south of Leningrad. Aboard was Molotov the chiefs of the Air Force, Navy, and Artillery, Trade Commissioner Alexei Gossigin, and Gorgi Malenkov, recently appointed to the State Defense Committee, the five-man body which made the essential decisions for the country during the war. Their train managed its way to Emga, to the east, but there they found the Germans trying to take control of the area from the air, so the train was stopped just in case it was found by a most fortunate German bomber. Yet they could not decide the fate of Leningrad without looking at it firsthand. Stalin would demand at least that. So the men continued on in a second, less ornate train. Having arrived, they quickly got the sense of what had become of the city of Lenin. The anti-air guns were going off most of the day, and certainly during the night. Everyone seemed to be in a panic. The people, because they distrusted what news they got and believed the Germans were just at the edge of the city. The military, because they were told to be on a constant vigil if they weren't being sent out on one of Stalin's counterattacks, which would produce results in time. But for now, it seemed to just be getting everyone sent out killed. And finally, the man in charge of the city's defenses, Zhidanov. The commission watched as telegram after telegram came in from Stalin, harassing Zhidanov about what he was doing to stop the Germans. Furthermore, what was he doing to drive them back? Why wasn't he using the tanks that Stalin just knew he had but was hiding? In truth, he did not have the number of tanks thought he had, and he certainly wasn't hiding any. Why weren't the factories that were still operational producing enough tanks to push back the Germans to Lake Ilmen to the south? What were the Finns doing? How was the city's defenses to the north? And on and on, each one ending with, I await your swift reply. Zhudanov, knowing how to play the game, would reply, 
in a timely manner and agree wholeheartedly with his commander. Then, hoping to get something useful out of this absurd exchange, would add on, in order to make your brilliant idea success, may I be allowed to keep two of the factories open to guarantee there are enough tanks at hand. Soon, Malenkov of the commission would be a go-between for Stalin and Zhudanov. It would be Malenkov who had tried, it has to be said, on more than one occasion to have Zhudanov killed. He would receive the communications from the military leader of Leningrad, attach his recommendations, and then pass them on to the party's leader. After a response was written, back it would go in reverse. The one thing the commission did not comment on, thus they must have approved of, was when ever-increasing lists were put out, saying who was to be next to be evacuated, as they may compromise the security of the city. On the list were Trotskyites, anarchists, Catholics, former Tsarist army officers, as well as diversionists, antisocial elements, thieves, and prostitutes. Yet, when the unfortunate were rounded up, the group consisted mostly of older women. These were the ones forced to leave town, perhaps taken to another city or to a camp. Either way, their lives were not about to improve. The fighting continued to rage east of Leningrad at Emga, the town itself, exchanging masters three times before the Germans kept control at the end of August. Now the last rail line was in German hands. Stalin, of course, was quick to react to this news. His message read, Stavka considers the Leningrad Front's tactics pernicious. It appears to know only one thing, how to retreat and how to find new lines of retreat. Haven't we had enough of these heroic defeats? But the Germans weren't done. They weren't stopping with Emga. Now having a foothold to the east of the Russian city, the Germans brought up more infantry and tanks from the 12th Panzer Division so they could push in both directions. The exhausted Russian defenders to the west of Emga were pushed back, closer to Leningrad. The Russians to the east were pushed all the way back to Ladoga. By September 8th, Schleselberg had fallen to the invaders, which meant that, at this point, there was no longer any land route from Leningrad. Any connection between the city and the rest of the Soviet Union would have to be by air or across Lake Ladoga. The Germans were at the gates of Leningrad. And yet, and this may seem puzzling to us, with hindsight, no one really expected a siege. Either the Germans would come in tearing into Leningrad and shoot everybody, or they would be pushed back. Stalin, obviously thinking of the former, wrote to Churchill on September 4th that, if truth be told, the Russian front had broken down. The only thing for it was for Britain to open a second front in France or in the Balkans by the end of the year. If this could be done, then perhaps 30 to 40 German divisions would be sent to deal with it, thus relieving some of the pressure off of Leningrad and Kiev and slow up the Germans who were now only 100 miles from Moscow. But before Churchill replied to Stalin that a second front in Europe would not be possible anytime soon, he first wrote to his, hopefully, guardian angel, Roosevelt, saying, we couldn't exclude the impression that they might be thinking separate terms. These were, indeed, dark days for the Allies. But having their own problems, Zhudanov and Voroshilov, knowing they could not delay, told Stalin on September 9th that Schlüsselberg had fallen, that the last land route had been lost. The Premier's response was everything they were hoping it would not be. We are disgusted by your conduct. All you do is report the surrender of this or that place without saying a word about how you plan to put a stop to all the losses of towns and railway stations. The manner in which you informed us of the loss of Schlüsselberg was outrageous. 
Is this the end of your losses? Perhaps you have already decided to give up Leningrad. What have you done with your KV tanks? Where have you positioned them, and why isn't there any improvement in the front, when you've got so many of them? No other front has half the quota of KVs that you have. What's your aviation doing? Why isn't it supporting the troops on the battlefield? Can we hope for some sort of improvement on the front? Or is Kulukik's help going to go for nothing, like the KVs? We demand that you update us on the situation two or three times a day. Yet even before this exchange, Stalin had decided that Leningrad needed another leader. So General Zhukov would be sent to take over. It seems that, indeed, a decision had been made as to the continued resistance of Leningrad. Everyone loves TV Dad. On the next TV Dad, presented by Progressive, TV Dad meets the prom date. So you're here to take my daughter out, huh? Uh, yes, yes, sir. Now, I'm only going to say this once. Drivers who switch and save with Progressive could save hundreds. Oh, I, I thought you were going to say take care of my little girl or something. <laughs> She's a kickboxer. She could take care of herself. Listen to your TV dad. Drivers who switch and save with Progressive could save hundreds. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates. Potential savings will vary.